Hi, this is Matthew Cratter from Trader University. And today we're going to answer the question, is the US dollar doomed? I'll jump right ahead and tell you that it is. This is not going to be a sensationalist video, but what you're going to learn is the way in which the US dollar was set up by be becoming a world reserve currency ensured its eventual destruction. If you're interested in learning how the economy actually works, how to make money in bull and bear markets, and how to protect your money from the coming US dollar devaluation, make sure you hit that subscribe button. So as I said, this is not going to be sensationalist, but we're really going to go through what uh, happened to the dollar and uh, what is going to happen to the dollar in the next 10 to 20 years. So we have to rewind very quickly, end of World War II, Europe had been, had been bombed to smithereens. This is the famous pictures of the uh, bombing of Dresden. Japan uh, was very close to being defeated in the war. We were about a year away from uh, dropping the nuclear bomb on them. Just uh, horrendous pictures. And uh, England, which had really had the previous world reserve currency, was kind of a mixture of British sterling and gold. But England was completely bankrupt after uh, at the end of World War II. Uh, they actually had to take a, a $4.3 billion loan from the U.S. just to, to keep going. And it's kind of interesting, the last installment of this loan was actually repaid as late as 2006. So there was only one natural survivor from the war. The United States was very lucky because we were sitting on North America. We were very far away from all the, all the destruction. There hadn't really been a war fought on American soil, a big war on American soil since uh, probably since the, the Civil War. You can talk about smaller wars. And so it made a lot of sense. Uh, it made a lot of sense to make the U.S. dollar the new world reserve currency. Also, when you win a war, you get to decide these things for better or for worse. So there was a new currency system set up, which I've talked about before, called the Bretton Woods system. There was a meeting uh, between United States, Canada, Western Europe, Australia, Japan, they went to uh, Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, which looks like a beautiful place currently within uh, Carroll, New Hampshire. They met at the Mount Washington Hotel and they set up the current financial system. So they made the US dollar the new world's reserve currency. They decided it would be at the center of everything. All the other satellite currencies would have to maintain a peg. They would have to make sure that they trade within somewhat uh, something around 1% of their current exchange rate. So we had Deutschmarks, we had Italian Lira, Canadian dollars, British, British pound, British sterling, uh, French francs, uh, Japanese yen. Obviously, this was before this, the setup of the euro and the European Union. Uh, British pound, I think I mentioned. And so you had all these currencies basically pegged to the US dollar or trading within certain trading band. And then the US dollar was pegged to gold. This is really what was underlying the whole system. They, uh, the uh, Western Europe and uh, actually much of the developed world been on a gold standard for a long time. And, um, and so it made sense that to, to continue this. And so one US dollar was still approximately 1 35th of an ounce of gold. One ounce of gold costs $35. Costs, uh, one ounce of gold today is $1,700. This gives you an idea of how much the US currency has already depreciated. So you had this basic system that was underpinned by the US dollar, which was backed by gold. But then the US did what the US does. They decided to print a whole bunch of dollars because it's fun to print free money. And they actually ended up printing more money than they had gold to back it up. So the way the US dollar theoretically worked, you could go to a bank, you could go to the US Treasury and say, here's a US dollar, give me 1 35th of an ounce of gold. The US dollar, it was paper money, it was convertible, it was like a gold certificate, it was convertible into actual gold. This was the promise that the government was making or the US Treasury was making. Now, obviously a lot of other countries didn't like this. Uh, Charles de Gaulle in France was famous for saying this was a system of uh, exorbitant privilege where basically the whole world was helping Americans uh, to have really high living standards and to live rich. So what he did was, what uh, Charles de Gaulle did, was he sent over uh, the French Navy. He sent it over to the United States and said, uh, please give me all the gold that I that you owe me. Here, here are my US dollars. Now, uh, other countries were doing this, and as a result, there's basically a run on gold. Gold was flowing out of the United States. And so then along comes Richard Nixon and says, you know what, 1971, 
you can't have gold anymore. We're not going to be uh, uh, gold. The U.S. dollar is no longer convertible into gold. It's just pieces of paper money. And so this was the uh, the real beginning of the modern economic system. After this, there was no longer a gold standard, but currencies just floated freely against each other. The Deutsche Mark versus the U.S. dollar, the uh, U.S. dollar versus the Japanese yen, etc. And the currency rate of gold and the U.S. dollar, as well as gold and uh, the Deutsche Mark, for example, they had their own uh, their own uh, currency rates as well. And what happened was gold began to go up in terms of every currency. Gold rallied in U.S. dollar terms. Gold rallied in Deutsche Mark terms. Gold rallied in yen terms, uh, simply because gold always does better than fiat currencies, than paper currencies. Now, this gave having the world reserve currency gave the U.S. a, a huge advantage, especially when they no longer, uh, when the U.S. no longer needed to worry whether U.S. dollars, new U.S. new U.S. dollars that was printing were backed by gold. So this is a lot of fun because you can just print money and you can use it to buy oil. You can print money and use it to buy bombs and buy warships and, and have a really strong military. And in this sense, the Soviet Union, obviously a central, a central planned economy, is, uh, just doesn't work. You, you can't have a bunch of bureaucrats deciding on the price of corn and wheat. But even, even beyond that, the Soviet Union never really stood a chance because they had to earn U.S. dollars by actually doing something and then take those U.S. dollars to buy oil or to buy steel, to build warships, or to buy uh, whatever materials go into bombs. The U.S. could just print money and buy these things, especially buying energy gave it a huge advantage. And this explains a lot of the U.S., uh, a lot of the uh, countries that are allies to the U.S., for example, and still uh, Saudi Arabia, etc. So U.S. gets to print money to buy whatever it wants. Americans have a very high standard of living. This is one reason the baby boomer generation uh, has had a very high standard of living and why subsequent subsequent generations, particularly beginning with millennials and Gen Z, their standard of living has been falling simply because, uh, well, you'll see what the transition is. But having the world reserve currency, being able to print money to get lots of nice stuff is one of the privileges. It's one of the benefits. Now, there are a lot of costs that come with having the world reserve currency. And this is one reason I say that the... Uh, the U.S. dollar was really doomed from the beginning. It's just a question of time. So when you have the world reserve currency, what that means is that your currency is used all around the world. So for example, right now, if you want to buy oil, you usually have to pay for it in dollars. If you're the Philippines, if you're Russia, if you're, um, if you're France, you still have to get your hands on some dollars to buy oil. This is gradually change, changing. China is trying to begin to use its currency to buy, to buy oil. There have been people who have tried to use euros to buy oil. But basically, the U.S. dollar is still the world reserve currency. There are a lot of international debts between countries that have nothing to do with the U.S. that are denominated in dollars. This is the whole euro dollar system that we've talked about in the past. So you have petrodollars, people using U.S. dollars to buy oil. You have people borrowing money in U.S. US dollars all around the world. And so you need to have a lot of U.S. dollars uh, sprayed all around the world. This is why, for example, the Swiss franc could never become the world reserve currency. The, co the, co the country of Switzerland is just not big enough. You need a big company. You need a big country like the British Empire, like the United States, the American Empire, uh, in order to produce enough of this world reserve currency. So if you have the world reserve currency, you need to spray your dollars all around the world almost by definition, because the dollars are going to be used all around the world. So how do you spray your dollars around the world? Well, you need to buy a lot of stuff from other countries. They give you stuff, you give them U.S. dollars, and then they can use those U.S. dollars to buy oil or to buy whatever else they need. Obviously, a lot of commodities are um, denominated in dollars, gold, etc. Now, in order to import a lot of stuff, if you're the United States, you need to encourage your citizens to buy a lot of stuff. You should say, don't save money. You need to buy a lot of stuff. This is what, what George W. Bush said after September 11th. He said, go shopping. You can imagine all the different things he could have said. But when you need to spray your dollars around the world and you have a, a, an economy that's 70% based on 
on consumption, on personal consumption, on the consumer, you have to basically have this culture where you have lots of ads, you encourage people to buy lots of stuff that they don't need, and as a result, the savings rates plummet. People can't save. And you tell people, you know, don't, don't, um, don't worry about the future. You really got to um, be young and party and buy lots of uh, stuff that you don't need. You need to buy a boat. You need to buy an RV. You need to buy a giant house. You need to fill that house with lots of stuff. And so this is one way as, um, uh, as a power that has the world reserve currency. This is one way you spread your currency around the world. You import lots of stuff. Now, unfortunately, this leads to consumer capitalism. I'm not a big fan of consumer capitalism. I'm a big fan of capitalism. But the problem with consumer capitalism is buying stuff is just a temporary fix. It makes you happy. Uh, getting a new car makes you happy for about a week. Anticipating getting a new car can make you happy for months and months and months thinking about it. But actually spending money, uh, the benefits of it wear off very quickly. It's obviously nice to have enough money so you don't have to sleep on the street. It's obviously nice to have enough money to get a car so you don't have to uh, rely on uh, public transportation and stand in long lines, stand out in the cold, etc. But after a certain point, and psychologists have put this point at around, uh, the last time I saw it was about $70,000 for an American. If you're making uh, $70,000 or more, uh, you're just as happy. So if you're making a million dollars, you're not happier than anyone who's making $70,000. Below $70,000, you're, you're maybe less happy because you don't have a house or you don't have a car, etc. But when you have the world reserve currency, you have to encourage your population to spend a lot of money. You get this sort of spiritually empty culture that, uh, that really afflicts a lot of Americans. And this is why uh, you have like the, uh, the hippie movement and the new age movement and various religious movements trying to find a way uh, out of consumer capitalism because shopping never provides true happiness. As a result, your whole entertainment culture, your movies, everything has to glorify spending money. When people say they want to become a millionaire, what they mean, uh, what they, they actually mean is they want to spend a million dollars rather than save a million dollars. But the actual way to, to become a millionaire is you have to save a million dollars, not spend a million dollars. So there are all these myths that come with uh, consumer capitalism. So as we said, you need to import more than you export. This is how you spray your dollars around the world. This means you need to run big trade deficits. So when various presidents talk about the trade deficit and how China's cheating us, etc., what's really happening is that uh, there are very structural things that are set up. The U.S. needs to run big trade deficits uh, with the rest of the world. So the U.S., it's not that China's cheating us uh, or cheating the United States. Uh, the U.S. has a trade deficit with Europe as well. This is what happens when you have the world reserve currency. You need to run big trade deficits. And as a result, you need to outsource your manufacturing. You need to outsource your factories. And what this does is it creates, it creates the rest, rust belt. It creates huge unemployment among the working class and among the middle class as all the manufacturing goes to Eastern Europe, goes to China, goes to the Philippines, etc. So you have a lot of people who lose their jobs because of this. Not everyone's cut out to be a, a high finance person or a computer programmer. You actually need uh, to have a diversified economy. You should have jobs. Uh, you know, It's good to have a country where you actually have factories and you make stuff as the United States has discovered during the COVID crisis when you outsource all your, all your pharmaceutical supplies, all your mask uh, production, etc., you can have a lot of problems. It's also, uh, you can have a lot of problems if you outsource your defense spending. If the bombs that you want to drop on your, drop on your enemy are actually made in that enemy's com country, you can run into problems. So this is one problem with trade deficits. It creates national security issues. It also hollows out the, woody, the working class and the middle class. And it leads to populist movements. Uh, the rise of Trump and populism is uh, easily explained by this, if not by other things. Now, you need to encourage people to take on a lot of debt. That's the other way you spend a lot. Once you've spent all the money you earn, you need to, uh, if you want your people to spend even more money, you need to, to invent the credit card, give everyone credit cards, try to get college kids hooked on credit, give them big student loans, and tell everyone they need to buy a house and get a big mortgage, etc. And so this leads to the, the debt problem. Now, more generally, 
uh, in addition to trade deficits, you need to run big current ad account deficits. A current account deficit is basically when money is flowing out of your country, both because you're importing more stuff than you're exporting, but also because you're paying foreign investors dividends, you're paying them rent because they're beginning to buy up your, your uh, country. So it's sort of a larger uh, cross-section. It includes trade deficits, but it also includes all this other money that's flowing out of the country. Now, when this happens, uh, when you have big trade deficits, so for example, uh, I buy a lot of Chinese goods. I make some guy a Chinese billionaire. He comes to the United States and buys up big swaths of Beverly Hills and uh, Hollywood Hills, for example, and starts owning big chunks of the country. He, he ends up buying uh, large amounts of Apple stock and Tesla stock, etc. This is what this is what happens when you send a lot of money overseas. The money comes back and uh, it, it is used to accumulate. Uh, big stakes in your in your in your companies in your publicly and pu privately traded companies, and in real estate. So in this sense, you're sort of selling uh, you're selling off bits and pieces of your country. I talk about this a little bit in the metaphor of Gunland versus Butterland, which I subtitled this is an explanation of trade deficits that uses two fictional countries, but basically how to sell your grandchildren into slavery. I'd encourage you to go watch this video. Uh, it'll make a lot more sense after you've seen uh, this video. So that's trade deficits. It's a way for the world reserve power, currency power to spray its dollars all over the world. Now, if you want people to trade using dollars, you also have to keep the trade routes open. You can't have uh, various canals. You can't have the Panama Canal closed or the Suez Canal or the Straits of Hormuz, all these uh, uh, straits that you need to keep open for moving goods and also obviously moving uh, moving crude oil. And uh, this is obviously what the British Empire did when it had the world reserve currency. It had these colonies all around the world. Uh, but as a result, uh, you need to, if you have the world reserve currency, you need to have a big military, basically to force everyone to use your currency and also to make sure that everything, uh, goods and services flow all around uh, the world. So. There was a guy called Saddam Hussein, and he tried in 2000, he said, you know what, I'm tired of, uh, I don't like the United States anymore, I'm going to sell my oil strictly in euros. And as a result, he ended up, uh, I would suggest this is one of the main reasons that uh, the US attacked Iraq in 2003. There are a couple articles here running up to it. Uh, Iraq nets handsome profit by dumping dollar for euro etc. But this is one reason, this is this is one explanation for the very bizarre thing that uh, September 11th happened and yet we attacked Iraq, uh, who doesn't really appear to have been behind September 11th. But usually money and uh, and uh, financial, financial flows are, explain a lot of things. So you need a big military uh, to keep the trade routes op open, also to bomb people who um, who try to uh, use a different use a different currency, and none of this is to excuse any human rights violations that Saddam Hussein did. Obviously, uh, just trying to provide a different different perspective here. Uh, the the uh, Iraq War ended up being extremely expensive for the United States. I believe it came the totals for Iraq and Afghanistan came to something like five trillion, which is uh, call it uh, 20 uh, 20 percent of current GDP roughly. Uh, and so these these wars can be very expensive and. You need uh, the world reserve currency country needs to take on more debt and tax its people more to pay for these wars. Plus the fact that wars are generally very unpleasant. You have young men from your country fighting young men from another country. And in another situation, these guys would be drinking beers and, and smoking together. So this is, this is really one thing behind a lot of war. I'm not going to say it's behind all war. But people wonder why is the U.S. so belligerent? Why is it always starting wars? Uh, especially when it's uh, not a lot of people attack the U.S. on U.S. soil, but it needs to um, it needs to have these wars in order to. Uh, it's another way of uh, ensuring that the U.S. dollar stays remains the U.S. Uh, remains the uh, global reserve currency. So what happens? This is uh, to to sum up. When you have the world reserve currency, you end up. Uh, you end up having a lot of wars. Now, one advantage, uh, one reason you also have a lot of wars is because you can print money to buy oil and to buy warships. 
And so if you let your defense department department do what it wants to do, it's naturally going to, going to do this. And it becomes a, a lot easier for a country like the United States that can just print money to buy whatever it needs for war to have a lot of wars. That's the other side of it. So when you have the world reserve currency, lots of wars, empty consumerist culture, you end off selling bits of pieces of your company of your country uh, because you have so much money flowing abroad and then it comes back and buys up huge swaths of your com country. You have a very low savings rate. And then as a result of this low savings rate, you're very vulnerable to any shocks to the system. So the average American has very, very little money set aside in savings. And uh, the, so when you have something like COVID, which shuts down the economy for a few, uh, a few months, uh, a lot of people, a lot of people are really hurting. Uh, people know they should save. On the other hand, uh, there's a lot of uh, popular culture that says you really shouldn't save. You should have a good time and spend your money. And this is part of what happens when you live in a country that has the world reserve currency. Now, let's talk a little bit more about how the relationship between the U.S. and China. I, I found a helpful way to think about this is in terms of vendor financing. So for example, you go to buy a GM car and they give you a car loan, which helps you buy it. So they provide both the product that they're selling as well as the financing. And this helps them to sell more cars. Likewise, this is what China has been doing with the U.S. really since, call it since 2001, when China was admitted into the World Trade Organization, the WTO. Basically, the U.S. buys stuff from China. We need to do this because we're the world reserve currency holder. We need to spray our dollars around the world. We buy stuff from China, and then they use the, those dollars to come back and buy our U.S. treasuries. Now, this was a virtuous circle really from 2001 to, call it 2013. And when China buys our treasuries. It helps to keep interest rates low here, keeps mortgage rates low so Americans can buy nice big houses. Uh, it keeps home equity rates uh, low so people can withdraw equity from their homes and buy more stuff with it. A lot of that stuff's made in China. And so we really have a system where it's kind of vendor financing, where we send our dollars to, we first outsource all of our manufacturing, all of our jobs, all of our factories to China they give us lots of stuff, we give them dollars, and they provide us with vendor financing. Now, this leads to the US government having lots of debt. US treasuries are government debt. And so you end up with this giant pile of debt. And because you are running current account deficits and trade deficits, you are really incented. And besides the whole culture just tells you you should borrow, the, the, the individual should borrow, companies should borrow, corporations should borrow states and uh, localities should borrow and the federal government should borrow. So you end up, everyone ends up with a lot of debt, especially the US government, this huge, uh, we have 25 trillion uh, of uh, treasuries outstanding roughly in terms of federal debt. And this debt needs to be rolled over. It's never, these sort of things never get paid down. And so then you run into a problem which happened in roughly 2013 when foreign investors, international investors, stopped buying the marginal treasury. And so then the U.S. really needed to absorb, to buy its own debt. It needed to stuff its U.S. banks full of debt, stuff hedge funds full of debt, etc. At the end of 2019, as I've talked about in previous videos, basically there was too much debt. The U.S. government had been running these huge budget deficits for many, many years, financing those budget deficits by selling treasuries. There was all this government debt and there was no one left to hold it. China stopped buying the marginal treasury, decided to invest in gold instead. And so you needed someone to buy uh, this government debt and that someone ended up being the Federal Reserve, the U.S. Central Bank. So what the Federal Reserve has been doing really since the third quarter of 2019, even before the COVID crisis, they've been printing new money, destroying the value of the US dollar, diluting the value of the US dollar, using that money to buy government debt. Now, what does quantitative easing or money printing to buy assets do? It causes huge wealth inequality. And the first time this actually happened was really in 2009, when during the wake of the great financial crisis, when uh, the Fed started printing money and buying treasuries. Now, what caused the great financial crisis? Well, we had this giant housing bubble, housing bubble, low mortgage rates uh, uh, caused by really ultimately having 
the global reserve currency. So you can see how this is all connected. There are many, many threads here that I'm trying to keep together. But we've really been having quantitative easing in the US since 2009. Uh, when the Fed tried to uh, sort of dial back on it in 2018, we got a mini stock market crash. So basically we're in this situation where we're speeding 100 miles per hour towards a wall and we, we cannot stop. We need to, US government needs to keep borrowing and the Fed needs to keep printing new money to monetize this borrowing and uh, to, to, to basically be the only buyer of these treasuries. Now quantitative easing or money printing and then buying assets by the central bank, it makes stocks and real estate prices go up a lot as they have in the last uh, 11 years since 2009. The, the upper middle class and upper classes disproportionately own a lot more stocks and real estate than the middle class and the working class. As a result, you get huge wealth inequality. As the rich get even richer, I've showed some of these charts in uh, in previous uh, in previous videos. But this is this is how you get uh, you get really rich people eating five thousand dollar hamburgers that have like gold leaf uh, between the bun and and uh, two thousand dollar truffle mushrooms in them, etc. etc. You get huge wealth inequality, and this obviously creates a lot of resentment, especially when you've taken the working class and sent all their jobs over to China. And as a result, you get riots, you get, you get a move toward populism in, in uh, politics, and you also get a move toward socialism in politics, where people say, you know what, the rich are living so well, uh, I would like to be taken care of too. I would, like, uh, I would like free checks from the government, I would like universal basic income, and how, how is the US government gonna pay for these additional services or these, this helicopter money, this free money, uh, they pay for it by issuing more debt, issuing more government debt, selling more treasuries, which gets bought by our central bank, the Federal Reserve, with newly created money. And this is where we are now. There's really, there's really no going back. We've got the populism of the left. We've got the populism of the right. We have uh, very little manufacturing left in the U.S. Perhaps after COVID, we'll, things will begin to turn the other way. But we have this situation where the US dollar is massively overvalued. It's overvalued simply because everyone needs US dollars to do business worldwide. They need it to buy oil. They need it to buy uh, US stocks. They need it to buy uh, th th uh, US real estate, et cetera, or to service their loans, their Euro dollar loans that are denominated in, in offshore dollars. And so, we have this situation where the federal government's gonna to have to continue increasing their debt, especially for all the entitlement spending to pay Social Security, Medicare for retiring uh, baby boomers. And the Fed is going to have to create new money and buy that debt. What this means is that the currency will continue uh, to, to uh, weaken. The US dollar will weaken, particularly against rare scarce assets like gold, Bitcoin and to a lesser extent, extent stocks. This is one reason I keep talking about gold and Bitcoin because of these underlying, uh, underlying dynamics. The US dollar as a world reserve currency probably only has, I really hesitate to put a number on this, but something like five to 20 years left. Uh, we can extend the time if we have a big uh, US dollar devaluation, which would just mean that gold and Bitcoin and stocks as well would go up quite a bit. Now, what we've been talking about, you can read more about, it's called the Triffin Dilemma. It's basically uh, the problem that happens to countries that have a global reserve currency. In order to have this global reserve currency, they have to basically uh, auction off their future, as we've seen that the US has done. They have to run up a lot of debt. They have to run massive uh, uh, budget deficits and trade deficits and uh, eventually sell off bits and pieces of their country and have a, a net uh, negative investment uh, position. This is one reason I'm so bullish on gold and Bitcoin, simply because this money printing is going to need to continue until, until we move to a new currency regime. Maybe that will be somewhat gold backed, uh, probably will not be Bitcoin backed, though Bitcoin will benefit from it it may be, it may end up, the new currency regime may end up being just a basket of foreign currencies. This is what Keynes actually 
was uh, voting for at, at Bretton Woods. We can talk more about that in another video. But what it means, what it means is that the US dollar is going down, gold is going up, uh, Bitcoin is going up, and stocks are going up. But stocks are not going to go up in real terms. We can see that stocks as measured in gold is the S&P 500, all the large cap companies in the US measured in terms of gold have been going down really since uh, since the year 2000. Gold has been strengthening more than stocks have been rallying. And this is really what's been happening in 2020. We've seen stocks go up and uh, particularly uh, NASDAQ stocks, QQQ stocks. And this has been happening less because the stock market is strong, but more because the US dollar is weak against scarce assets. I'm not saying necessarily against other fiat currencies like the yen or the euro, that we have seen some weakening of the US dollar in the last couple of weeks, which helps the US stock market. But really, the US dollar is weakening against real scarce assets, scarce real estate, Bitcoin, gold, and to a lesser extent, stocks. Hope you guys found this uh, video helpful. Let me know your questions and comments below, and please hit the subscribe and like button if you found this helpful. Thanks a lot for listening, and hope you guys have a good weekend. I'll see you in the next video.